<laughs> All right, so second half of section 7-5, we want to pick up with example number 8. So page 475, example number 8. Um, they asked me to do the definite integral. Now, we have six integration formulas that we're working with here on the top of our note sheet. You might remember in the back of your textbook, in the back covers back there, you have like 120 different integration formulas that you work with. You will get to the point in Calculus 2, or maybe even the end of Calculus 1, where you will have just a huge list of integration formulas, and you'll hit a problem, and you'll have to try to decipher which formula matches up with the problem that I have so I know which one to use. So it won't be an issue of memorizing a bazillion formulas. It'll be an issue of, okay, if I have this list of formulas, choosing the appropriate one. So we get a, a miniature scale um, version of that in example number eight. When I look at example eight and I'm trying to figure out which one of these formulas is going to be most appropriate, the first thing I notice is that I have a radical in the denominator. So, you know, up to this point, we probably have, uh, you know, maybe 30 different integration formulas that we know. Um, there aren't going to be many of those that would have a radical in the denominator. So that would be a way for me to narrow it down to perhaps my inverse trig formulas. All right? If I'm looking at these inverse trig formulas, you'll notice that this one and this one do not have a radical on the bottom, so they're out. You'll notice that this one has a radical on the bottom, but it also has another x on the outside of that radical. I don't have that in mind. So that means that these two are also out. So that narrows it down to inverse sine and inverse cosine. They're the same formula, it's just that inverse sine is positive and inverse cosine is negative. So I look at my problem and mine is positive, and you'll notice that I would have a match there for 1 over the square root of 1 minus a quantity squared, 1 over the square root of 1 minus a quantity squared. So that's kind of the process of elimination that I can follow to determine I want to use that first formula. Okay? Now, when I use that first formula and I'm looking at the formula says the square root of 1 minus x squared, I don't have x squared. I have 4x squared. What is 4x squared? Um, what value squared gives me 4x squared? 2x. 2x, right. So I could rewrite that as 2x squared, but because that's a quantity, I'm going to need to substitute it out with u substitution. So that that way, if I put a u in the place of that 2x, then I would have 1 minus u squared, and then I would have a match for that formula. All right, so if I'm going to let u be equal to 2x, then what is my differential du? 2, 2 dx, right. I don't have 2 dx, I have 1 dx, so how do I get rid of that 2? Divide. Divide it out, right. So 1 half du will be dx. So let's go ahead and put that in. I'm going to replace the 1 dx that I had with 1 half du. Alright, then down here we had already said that 2x is u, so down here in our denominator we're going to have the square root of 1 minus u squared. If I'm going to change the x's to u's in my integrand, then I'm also going to need to change my upper and lower limits of integration. My a and b value, I need to change those from x's to u's as well. So let's start with, I had x is equal to 1 fourth. If x is equal to 1 fourth and u is 2 times x, then 2 times 1 fourth would give me 1 half. Yes, yeah, so my upper limit is going to be 1 half. And then we had x is equal to 0. So if x is equal to 0 and u is 2 times x, then what's u? 0, right. So now we've got new limits. All right, so if I notice this is a perfect match for my formula, 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared, 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared. So I can just um, take that constant of 1 half and pull it out in front, and I'm going to replace this with what it's equal to, which would be the inverse sine function. Because this is a definite integral, then let's go ahead and put 1 half in the place of u and 0 in the place of u. And this is why yesterday they took all of that time in the first half of the lesson to redefine for us what an inverse trig function was and how to evaluate the basic problems 
before we even got to the derivatives yesterday because as we do the integration we have to actually evaluate regular <coughs> inverse trig functions right so let's think about that first one the inverse sine of one half by definition when we see inverse sine one half that means sine is equal to one half and I only have first and fourth to choose from we learned yesterday that we get all that from its definition so first off am I in the first quadrant or the fourth quadrant first how do you know because it's positive if this had been a negative one half then I would have known I was in the fourth quadrant so then I need a reference angle where is sine equal to one half in the first quadrant pi over, over six so that's my reference angle and so from there I can say okay if I'm in the first quadrant then my angle is just my reference angle and so my answer would be pi over six so we can replace inverse sine of one half with pi over six if you were on a portion of the um, AP exam where you could use your calculator then you could throw that in of course it's not going to give you pi over six it's going to give you the decimal equivalent but in radian mode it will um, do that inverse trig function for us all right look at the second part of that inverse sine of zero by definition that means that sine is equal to zero and I only have first and fourth to choose from so where is sine equal to zero on the line, on the line right so that would be what values zero pi two pi three pi that type of thing right so if I'm looking at just the region over here that's first and fourth quadrant then that eliminates the pi so that means that my answer would only be zero so I can come down here then and replace inverse sine of zero with zero so now I have one half times pi over six so pi over twelve minus zero and so I'll get pi over twelve on the bottom of page 475 they give me another formula and this formula is particularly helpful because in each of the formulas that we had here on the top of the page for our inverse trig functions they were all x squared plus one I wasn't allowed to have a different constant value other than one whereas you'll notice in this formula I have x squared plus a squared where a is a constant so it might be two squared or ten squared or twenty seven squared but I could have a different value in there other than one and so that leads us to example ten uh, we proved this formula that um, they give us here you can see the proof for that in example number nine uh, but for example number 10 we have the integration of x over x to the fourth plus 9 dx so if I'm matching it up to the formulas I would easily be able to eliminate all of these up here because they're all x squared plus 1 or x squared minus 1 or 1 minus x squared I have a quantity squared plus another number squared so you can see how that's going to match up with our quantity squared plus another number squared here all right so down here in the bottom where I have um, x to the fourth plus nine that's going to be something squared plus something squared what is x to the fourth x squared squared right and what is nine three squared good so it's perfectly fine for me to have something other than one here that's what the formula indicates that that's just a constant but it is not okay for me to have something other than x squared I have x to the fourth so I'm going to need to substitute that out so I'm going to let u be equal to x squared so what would my differential du be 2x. 2x dx right and I have an x dx so what do I need to do divide by 2 so 1 half du will give me x dx so let's start by replacing our x dx so that's going to be the 1 half du and then down here in the bottom remember if u was x squared then this would be u right here so u squared plus 3 squared right so now we have a perfect match for our formula this constant out in front isn't going to interrupt anything so I have the integration of 1 over x squared plus a squared and you'll notice that we have u in the place of x and we have 3 in the place of a and that's going to be important because when I come over here you'll notice that I'm having to plug x and a into my answer so I need to know what those things are so I'm going to copy 
the answer leaving out the X and A so we can go back and fill those in together. So we've got our constant one half out in front. Alright, so we start here, we're going to have 1 over A. So what's A again? 3. So we'll have 1 over 3 inverse tangent, and then over here we're supposed to have X over A. So what will that be? U squared. U over 3, right, because we're putting U in the place of X, and we're putting 3 in the place of A. Now, we were the ones who chose to substitute, so we have to back substitute, right? So then we can go back and we can put our X squared back in the place of the U, and we could do 1 half times 1 third is 1 sixth, and that's all the simplifying that we can do. Alright, so for tonight we're working on the integration. Don't forget that we have our quiz tomorrow. No calculator of any kind for our quiz tomorrow.